book is about social enterprise law, and a lot of people might be wondering what social enterprise is. Steve? Social enterprise law often is referred to as a, you could either have a double bottom line, or some folks think it was a triple bottom line, but that's, I think, getting a little, I think a little further than it needs to go. Um, but the basic idea is that it's neither a traditional for-profit uh, nor uh, a, a true charity. Uh, it's something that combines doing well and doing good. Uh, not in the sort of afterthought way that uh, corporate social responsibility envisions it, just sort of making profit but not being quite as evil as you might otherwise be, uh, but really trying to pursue a specific uh, or perhaps several specific social missions uh, along with a desire to prosper. Our book looks at how law can uh, intersect with social enterprise and law has been sometimes framed as a real threat to this idea of combining uh, social mission and a desire to earn profits for owners and the thesis of our book is that law can really be an ally and it tries to be very positive about all the things that law can do to help social enterprises flourish but it recognizes that there are challenges and some of those are challenges that B-Lab and Rick's work has been aimed at trying to solve as well. Um, so two of them that are the most well known, I think, are the B Corp certification that B Lab provides to businesses who pursue a social mission. And I think what's really revolutionary about what B Labs has done here, and this is really the core of what we're trying to do in the book, um, is make it clear uh, that law is not a threat uh, to this, as it's often perceived. You know, beginning, not perhaps not beginning, but certainly. Uh, 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 spotlighted with the Ben and Jerry's takeover by Unilever, uh, where it's widely perceived, I think incorrectly, that the law did it, right? The law is the, the butler who did it in the pantry. The law is the one that made uh, Ben and Jerry's sell out, which it's not, it's certainly not clear they did that, um, uh, and it definitely isn't true that the law made them do it. And I think what B Lab has managed to do, what we talk about in the book, is how the law can uh, become uh, sort of a framework or support uh, uh, support uh, you know good companies as you say Rick mm -hmm. um, but also um, to allow folks to find each other and that's another piece of what we're doing in the book so we're, we're trying not just to um, as B Lab has done so well with the benefit corporation uh, sort of reverse that misperception that the law is always the bad guy uh, and make the law an ally some of the tools we talk about in the book that Dana maybe could address uh, uh, are really designed not just to uh, allow social enterprises to exist, but also to prosper. Yes, so the, the book talks about lots of different kinds of intervention, intervention that would require public investment and public involvement, like legislative changes, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas that rely on private ordering, contracting, deal structure, elements uh, that can be negotiated for, which we think that social enterprises and the entrepreneurs and investors that stand behind them can use to signal to each other and match up with folks who fall at the same point along this continuum of how much mission and how much profit do you want out of a particular venture. Uh, so as Steve said, we have many different proposals in the book, lots of different chapters that provide uh, uh, different kinds of solutions that might be appropriate for different kinds of social enterprises. But just to give a few examples, some of our favorites are finance-based. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Flypaper, uh, both because of the silly name uh, and uh, the way that it, you know, you could use it tomorrow. You know, if you get the right lawyers together, you could... Uh, pull together a deal and use this contingent convertible debt instrument uh, to finance a, a startup tomorrow. Right, so the idea behind Flypaper is that it's a contingent convertible note and we think that sophisticated investors could easily follow that kind of framework that we provide in the book uh, to design a note that has a relatively long maturity uh, a, a relatively low yield compared to market if the investor is willing to add that signal of a concessionary return, and other terms that identify the investor as really committed to mission to help the entrepreneur to trust the investor. And then it's convertible, so the conversion terms allow the investor to share any spoils if the entrepreneur decides to sell out and uh, sell the equity without uh, uh, giving an opportunity for the investor to share under a traditional note by converting to equity, the investor would be able to share. So our hope is that 
uh, something like a flypaper vehicle, this contingent convertible note, will help entrepreneurs and investors find each other uh, and also to self-enforce. So they won't have to rely on uh, public entities to uh, help enforce. They won't have to rely on a huge marketplace of enforcement. They can just rely on each other and the terms in their individual deal. But if, of course, the, the problem, uh, as uh, some folks might have experienced uh, while you're describing it, is that sounds very complicated. Um, and if you're investing late at night from your jammies, um, you know, via crowdfunding, uh, your eyes are going to glaze over uh, pretty quickly uh, when you see that. Um, so that's not the only way we do it. And this is also, I think, part of what uh, B-Lab has done with its benefit corporations to have things that are off the shelf, right? So uh, what we're just talking about, flypaper, that's sort of, uh, that's very bespoke, right? You would need sophisticated uh, attorneys to be able to craft it so that nobody's taken, uh, taken the cleaners. Um, uh, how do you see the role of uh, sort of off-the-shelf versus bespoke legal tools uh, for uh, uh, sort of social enterprise law going forward? So it's an interesting question, and I, I will say that like, I like what you do in the book where you sort of start with, uh, with the, the true off-the-shelf, which is the legal forms, and trying to come up with legal forms that are sort of easy to buy into and have a, a brand almost. Then you sort of make the point that, but that's great, and that sort of controls the company, but you really want to bring the capital in. And, that, and that's, if you don't bring the capital in, it's not going to work. And while, while I hear you about this bespoke nature, perhaps, of flypaper, I think what you've done is actually pretty good toward moving that toward like a, a turnkey solution, because you see all the time in um, the startup and the venture market, safes or whatever that are fairly complicated but a they come to have a state. future equity so they're you know we're not the only ones with clever names yeah. uh, so, so they come to have like a pretty well-known form that that it's, it's not going to be too expensive to negotiate and, and that's how you can really start to bring capital into these organizations and again as you say use the law as a tool but the story of, of uh, innovations like the simple agreement for future equity is one that you know we take as an object lesson too with interventions like flypaper and we hope that you know we've come up with one proposal but the book also theorizes kind of what is necessary from an instrument in order to lock in uh, mission and, and make the investment safe uh, you know, there we, there we go. You know uh, for both sides I uh, kind of convince them to trust each other and then we hope that there'll be experimentation right in the legal community in the investment community to perhaps tinker with that model and then one might emerge as something that could be more replicable yeah. one thing i want to make sure that people are listening to this is like we're sort of talking like the book says here's how this corporation works and here's how the supply paper works but it's actually got this um terrific scheme of there's more questions in there than, than, than answers. I mean, it's sort of amazing that you sort of go through, well, here's one problem and you could try to fix it this way and here's another problem. And I think it sort of gives a great map for you know somebody to come out and do something that's an improvement on flypaper because you're sort of anticipating all these issues. And, and it's important, I mean, this is true with social enterprise law. In some ways it is more complicated than regular old corporate law because in regular old corporate law, you have one goal make as much money as possible. Although and I'm not, I think the jury's still out on whether that's in fact what it requires. But let me but just say, not, not as a legal matter, you know, uh, but, but just as like, that's how the capital markets speaking. work. Sure. Sure. And, yeah. and, okay. and now we're Fair trying enough. to say, no, there's some other important things. We actually want these enterprises to care about their workers and the environment and the mm. community. So it becomes multidimensional and that is more complicated.